Okay, let's start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. I'm very happy today to announce our speaker, Professor Lev Truskinovsky. Many of you know Lev very well because uh, he's currently at the uh, in, uh, SNRS Research Director. It's another abbreviation, ESP. CI, which uh, Lev can translate for us. <laughs> it is uh, <laughs> a core superior physique. Shimi. Shimi. And, but before moving to France, uh, Lev was the associate professor at the Department of Aerospace Engineering here at the University of Minnesota. Ali turned out to be his student, which we found out today. So, and a lot of you know Lev uh, at that time. Uh, Lev um, is a very distinguished person in a few days it would be a conference which would celebrate his achievements and if one look at the list of invited speakers you could uh, easily see the level of recognition and respect that Lev has in the community he spent some time as a postdoc with Jim Rice right or type anyway uh, Lev um, is a former president of International Society for Interaction of Mechanical Mathematics, and he's also editor-in-chief in the journal Continuum Mechanics and Thermodynamics. He was a fellow of Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University and spent a year as invited professor uh, at the Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, also in Harvard. He has over 120 publications, and his area of interest are uh, plasticity, fracture, and uh, phase transitions. And now he moved to work in biomechanics, area of biomechanics. And I will not take more time. Please join me in welcoming Lev. Thank you, uh, Sonia, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have many friends here over the years, accumulated, and uh, lots of fond memories. And uh, this department has been always very interesting and unusual, because despite its very applied, seemingly, profile, it, it had contributed quite significantly to the fundamental issues of solid mechanics. Uh, and this is uh, quite a remarkable. And I encounter in my career in different countries the mention of uh, people from this department, like, for instance, uh, particle methods of Peter Kandel, the pioneering work of Henry Drescher in, uh, in uh, granular media, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's a quite a special place, and it's an honor to be here and to speak uh, about my research. So this is a relatively recent uh, focus uh, on biological issues. And uh, I can tell you the story how I became interested. I was still in aerospace engineering here. And there was a project at the department on building the flying object of uh, uh, millimeter size or centimeter size. And at that time, it was clear that it should be flapping wings. But the problem was how to, uh, how to separate mechanism, material, and engine. And then it became clear that in biology, all those are combined. So like in our cars, we produce motion in one place, we transmit it into another place. While uh, in biological systems, uh, all those things are blended together. And this is a kind of a challenge of engineering today to to try to understand how, we, how, how to combine mechanism, material, and engine. And so muscles is an ex one of the examples. Uh, uh, what, I, what I'll try to convince you that it's the simplest example of this system. In biology, there are much more uh, complex systems of this type. So it's a natural uh, starting point. And uh, so I'll tell you about this research that has been conducted uh, together with the three former uh, PhD students of mine, Matthew Carroll, Raman Sheshka, and Pierre Richaud. So there is some evidence I want to show you of some recent 
interest in uh, uh, artificial systems that uh, mimic the activity of muscles. For instance, you see uh, muscle-inspired uh, metastructures, muscle-like uh, engineering metastructures. This is just one group from an arbor that is trying to really uh, implement at a larger scale uh, the behavior of, of muscles. And uh, there, are, there are many more, and uh, obviously we would like to have uh, all kinds of cables that would uh, uh, self-tighten and uh, would behave intelligently in a sense, and that's uh, why it's of interest. So, uh, you see muscle tissues, uh, can be viewed as prototypes of new materials that can actively generate stresses. And active generation of stresses, uh, we know that uh, when we are holding a load, uh, although it's a perfectly static process, there are no springs inside that are stretched. Uh, in fact, we are, uh, we are sweating uh, and the body gets warm. On one side, on the other side, if we stop eating, for instance, then we cannot hold uh, the load anymore. So, which means that behind this seemingly uh, straightforward process of generation of force, uh, there is a dynamics, there is an active dynamics. So, so that's an interesting part here that you cannot uh, somehow treat it as a, as a static phenomenon. Although you, you are seeing springs here, but uh, those springs are only part of the machinery. But in fact, there are factories. There are factories producing forces. And that's what we uh, want to understand, how to build these fact factories at the micro scale and how to uh, embed them into material and make a distributed systems of this type. Uh, so another thing that attracted my attention at the time were, were this type of pictures. So uh, you see here, it's a kind of a force elongation relation or stress strain relation, and it's non-monotone. It's non-monotone, and uh, you, you know from your <laughs> courses in, uh, and really people talking here about free energy. So it's not just a snap spring here mechanically where you can control its stability uh, uh, by just controlling some displacements. It's a free energy, so it's already uh, averaging over many, many degrees of freedom, kind of relaxation of the system. And so you know that uh, uh, typically those systems are unstable. Uh, you, you learn all kinds of criteria of stability in solid mechanics where uh, mm, the inequality usually prohibit this non-monotone or softening behavior. On this range, you expect all kinds of instability. And I could not easily dismiss those pictures because, for instance, Huxley is a Andrew Huxley is a Nobel Prize winner and the former president of uh, Royal Society, a post occupied by Newton at some point. So this is a very serious research. This is from uh, Cavendish lab. Uh, so how can we mechanically understand those uh, negative stiffness in a sense and stable behavior of, with negative stiffness? And then if you look at other system, biological system, you see that it's quite ubiquitous, in fact. So, so the challenge was to understand how it works and why it's a negative stiffness and why it's still stable uh, in, uh, this, in, in this case. Now, when you look at an anatomical picture of muscles, you see uh, what we would call composite structure with a hierarchy of scales. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of things to understand here, but we'll try to understand it at the level of single cells. And single cells are those uh, so-called myofilaments. Uh, they are elongated objects. So we want to understand cell because, uh, re uh, and then we want to understand particularly muscle cells. So among cells, muscle cells occupy a particular place that I'll explain, and that is a natural object first of, st of study. So if you look at the cells, uh, uh, they're filled with stuff. And the stuff that uh, ensures, for instance, rigidity uh, of, of those systems. And this stuff, this structure, is called cytoskeleton, many of you know. 
And uh, those are all kinds of uh, uh, artistic representation of this. And this is more real uh, 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 micrographs. Uh, so you see some random networks with some kind of strange cross links here and there. And there are two features uh, of this uh, strange material. First, it's positioned between solid and fluid because cell, when it needs to, for instance, penetrate through the blood vessel, uh, in the case of metastatic uh, phenomena, it becomes like very fluid. But on the other hand, when it has to deal with some obstacles, it can uh, uh, perform quite a significant uh, develop force uh, uh, on, this, on, on the constraints. So it also can be uh, behave in a solid way. So it's between solid and fluid, and we don't know those materials, how to make them, and uh, uh, we even uh, uh, have different departments usually uh, teaching those subjects. Now, uh, another interesting thing that it has complex architecture. And although this architecture looks fully random, but it's known, for instance, that if you apply locally a force to cytoskeleton, uh, it doesn't propagate in a so-called elliptic way. Uh, uh, it, it propagates through so-called force chains. Uh, force chains, and this is somewhat similar to force chain in granular materials, which uh, really signifies that there is elasticity, but it's highly degenerate elasticity and highly special. So it's very economical. So it works a bit like a mechanism that channels the force where it needs to arrive, but it doesn't waste uh, kind of resources in a sense on, on spreading it. So another thing is that uh, those systems are usually driven internally rather than externally. So there is a, uh, so this force generating so-called motors that exist inside and, uh, and they load those structures or pre-stress the structures internally and they're constantly out of equilibrium. So this is a particular side of this story. All right, so uh, let's, so I, I, I know that some of you uh, might have even studied muscles, but uh, since it's a civil engineering department, I will spend some time on giving some background that can be found in standard textbooks. So uh, it, on, on certain, Perspective, it looks like a crystal because this myofibril that we want to study, if you look from the side, it looks like <coughs> hexagonal crystal. However, this crystal is not made of points, interacting, let's say, points or atoms. It's made of interacting uh, myofibers. And uh, here you see the structure in this direction. So those, uh, there is a thicker and thinner fibers and the system seem to be uh, 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 kind of uh, in interdigitated in this sense. It uh, repeats itself. Uh, there is some periodic structure, but you can see that the, the degree of overlap between these fibers can, can change. So those are the pictures of uh, how it looks uh, uh, in, in a real experiment. Now, so what's the difference between general cytoskeleton and muscle? So in the general cytoskeleton, you have these networks of these fibers, and these fibers interact through passive crosslinks and active crosslinks. These active crosslinks are the, one that, uh, the ones that uh, contribute to force generation. So this is usually quasi-random, but in fact, highly correlated uh, structure. So it's in fact, it's a build structure. Or, uh, it's not built uh, by uh, an intellect, it's built by self-organization. And we still don't understand fully how it's organized. And this elasticity, for instance, of this structure is quite amazing. But that's a complex uh, issue. So the simplest issue is when those fibers are highly organized. So it's like an army in the world of, of uh, cytoskeleton. And this is a muscle. So they're geometrically highly organized. So there are two types of fibers. They, uh, they organize in almost one-dimensional uh, way. And, uh, and as you see here, the fibers have some appendages, and those appendages dynamically interact uh, with the 
thicker filaments, and that's how force is generated. Okay, so now, but we need to simplify it. In order to make models, we need to simplify things, and uh, uh, so we can first identify some force producing uh, unit. Uh, it's called usually a sarcomer. Those are the fibers. This is schematic uh, representation of this uh, 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 appendages. So they're called myosin heads. And then you can look at them. They have also, uh, they have the internal structure. And it turns out that the simplest representation of internal structure of, e of each of these uh, elements is a bistable spring and a, a normal spring connected in parallel. Bistable is because those heads can be in two conformations. Now, how it's all organized? It's also interesting uh, because, uh, again, uh, if you carefully try to unfold the topology of the structure, you will see that uh, what's prevailing here is a domine domineering here, a parallel connection. Parallel connection uh, of these kind of elementary uh, systems that can undergo conformational change. Uh, and this is, by the way, the very characteristic feature of biological systems uh, comparing to, say, uh, crystals where short-range interactions dominate and uh, uh, that uh, defines their properties. So in, in, uh, here you have, uh, you can say, Long, uh, the, the elementary unit here is actually a parallel uh, cluster of parallel elements. So if you see, those elements are not interacting only each uh, with each other, with the, with the nearest neighbors. There is a, there is a longer range interaction uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is ensured by elastic backbones. And so those backbones essentially dominate uh, the system. And you will see that ultimately this is behind the, this unusual uh, mechanical properties of the system. And this is a schematic uh, picture of this uh, bistable element it's, uh, uh, that can be in two, two conformations and the switch from one conformation to another. It's called the power stroke. So the goal is to put it all together and to uh, uh, and to understand uh, also the role of activity, because here this is a scheme that could be just a scheme of a structure, so there is no activity here. So we'll first uh, start with uh, what is usually <coughs> called passive behavior of this system. And it's already very interesting. So this is a simple experiment. People take a muscle. Uh, put it in what we would call hard device, but uh, they would call it length clamp uh, device. And then uh, they, uh, they uh, abruptly change the length. In, partic in particular, what they do, they just take a, a muscle like this and then they shorten it. So it forms a slack. And as a result here, you record the tension. So this is a tension that was in the system before and then suddenly drops. But then it miraculously recovers. So the system is, picks up the slack and looks like it happens in two, uh, uh, in two uh, steps. <coughs> so first there is a fast step about millisecond time uh, where some intermediate level is achieved. And then there is a longer uh, period which may be 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds when Finally, the force is fully recovered. So this first stage uh, is called passive response because it happens so fast that the delivery of fuel, in a sense, uh, would, uh, would be a rate-limiting stage. So uh, the, uh, the fuel here, which is so-called ATP, is hydrolysis of certain highly energetic molecules that is like uh, uh, gasoline in the system. So it, it just doesn't have time to arrive at these times. So, it's, so the response is purely passive. And then there is an active uh, final recovery of a force. It's an active stage. It's slower. And here there is a full evidence that activity is, uh, is playing a big role. 
So, uh, so the first thing is to understand how it picks up the slack uh, uh, passively. For instance, we would have liked to have in our structures uh, devices like this that can self-tighten uh, when uh, uh, you shorten them accidentally. And behind it is this uh, uh, power stroke in the, in the myosin head. So here there is a kind of a cartoon of this molecule. In fact, it has uh, uh, around 1,000 different uh, units there. But uh, in fact, it works like a mechanism. So most of the degrees of freedom relax almost uh, instantaneously at these time scales. But there is a slow degree of freedom, uh, which is form a kind of lever arm. And that's another mystery, how those molecules manage to, uh, to separate those uh, uh, degree of freedom into very fast one, uh, majority of very fast one, and few very slow one. How these mechanisms are emerging uh, by themselves. OK, so our first uh, focus will be on passive uh, behavior. And uh, uh, yeah, this is just another comment on this. Uh, both stages, people think that uh, passive behavior is due to this power stroke or the conformational change in this myosin head. And I'll, uh, I'll explain how it works. And the lower stage is uh, due to detachment of these uh, uh, whole structures and reattachment in another place. So the passive behavior, would, this is very famous in biochemistry of this molecular uh, Lim-Taylor cycle. And we'll first talk about this uh, passive stage, this power stroke. Suppose we want to make a machine that would uh, behave in the same way. Uh, so somehow understand what are these guys here, how, how they mm, are organized. So the first idea is just, oh, maybe it's just a viscoelasticity. So we can think how to imitate this behavior, this uh, partial recovery. And in fact, it's not difficult to come up with this type of machine with a dashboard and the two springs, uh, which would be in the linear regime, we would really recover part of the force. So first response will be of this spring. And after a while, after this dashboard would respond, the stiffness would drop. And then you could have this behavior. However, in uh, experiment shows that uh, the first stage, it is like this. So somewhere there is this uh, parallel spring. But then uh, it's a highly nonlinear response. And moreover, there is a plateau here. There is a plateau. So, so this is not just uh, uh, visco linear. At least it's not visco linear viscoelasticity. So whatever stands for this dashboard here uh, has a complex uh, structure. So let's make a model. So to make a model, our goal would be not to include all what is possible, but to drop all what is possible to, to, and to leave only the essential elements here. So again, we have this structure that we can try to represent as uh, now we are at the time scales when detachment doesn't happen. So those elements are all attached. So you can view them as this structure. But then you can. Uh, also take into consideration that the elasticities are different. Uh, uh, it's, they're much stiffer, those fibers, that the connecting uh, uh, bridges. And so uh, ultimately, the model is very simple. You have a parallel connection of those units. Uh, and there is a parallel spring here. And the, uh, for simplicity, you can use double well potential for each of these uh, uh, re describing those two, two states. So what happens is that when we apply load, we uh, bias the system. Uh, we bias one of the wells, and uh, in particular the shortest well. And then the system undergoes conformational change from long position to a small position, uh, small uh, configuration. That's how the force is <coughs> recovered. So that's uh, basically how this machine works. So we can write an energy. Very simple. But then we cannot minimize it because the system is uh, 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 working at finite temperature. That's very important because the, the distances here, the size of this power stroke is uh, 2 nanometers. So we have to take temperature into consideration. That's very important that 
microscopic structures would work in the Brownian environment. So, which means that they're constantly bombarded uh, by the environment that ensures uh, uh, a given temperature and, and it's not a detrimental thing. So, the, the, the question is how to design your machine in such a way that it would take advantage of this bombardment rather than uh, being uh, distracted or disoriented by this noise. So noise is very important. Noise is, uh, should be used. Okay, so what do we do in this case if there is a noise? Uh, in fact, we are looking for equilibrium response, for instance. We'll also talk about non-equilibrium. And then we have to compute so-called statistical sums, uh, which means that we have to, the system is not living in just uh, one of the states, which may be the global minimum of the energy, but the system visits all the states with different probabilities. People understand how to assess those probabilities from the times of Boltzmann, and you have to average. So if, when temperature is very low, the system is in fact, spends most of the time, or the probability is largest for the state with a uh, global minimum of the energy. So it reduces to our mechanics when the t when temperature, now beta is inverse temperature, so when beta goes to infinity, you can easily show that uh, the system is in a global minimum. But uh, but when the temperature is finite, you can have a different behavior. So, uh, so if you formally compute it, and here I, I spare you of the details. In fact, everything can be done analytically even for this simple model with biquadratic potential. You're getting these uh, strange uh, figures. So you see beta 6, it means... Uh, High temperature, beta 12, it means lower temperature. So at high temperature, it's relatively monotone, but still it has a region with a negative slope. But at low temperature, you have just abrupt behavior. So, uh, and this is used already now. Uh, for instance, this is a paper recent from Nature Materials. Mechanical metamaterials with negative compressibility transitions. So it's not in this system, but in other system, people uh, notice that this can be achieved. So what's interesting here is that it's a bistability here uh, that is resistant to fluctuations. Fluctuations do not uh, uh, diffuse this. Uh, the snap spring survive its snap spring property uh, in the presence of fluctuations. And it happens because of, uh, uh, because of uh, cooperative behavior of these units. So it's not obvious here, of course, but now I will explain very schematically uh, why behind it there is a cooperative uh, behavior. So the snap spring, uh, this uh, uh, power stroke is happen happens collectively rather than individually. If they would switch individually each element, you would have a uh, monotone here behavior. Now, in particular, there is this regime around B equal 8 where you have a vertical derivative and, in fact, it's a critical behavior here and, the, for instance, correlation length diverges here and that's a very interesting regime which seems to be close to, as I will going to show, where the real muscles uh, perform. Now, why is it long-range interactions here playing a role? So if we look carefully at this energy, uh, we can, of course, in a statistical model, we have to uh, average all of them over this uh, uh, canonical ensemble. But let's suppose the variable y, which is macroscopic, relatively macroscopic, because n may be, for instance, 1,000 units here, and, and y is the, uh, is the position of the backbone, so it's a relatively macro degree of freedom. So instead of, uh, uh, so we can just eliminate it, minimize it out. And in fact, it's in, yeah, so we can minimize it out. So we can express it through variables x, that's a position of the, uh, yeah, it's not shown here, it's a position of the system inside the double well potential. You will see that the resulting energy has the sum of xi squared. So if you open it, you will have the products of xi, xj's, and it's all over the system. So each element interacts with each element. So this is qualifies in, as a 
long-range interaction, in particular mean field interactions in the system. And it's this, and it's known in statistical mechanics that uh, the con conventional fact that free energy must be necessarily convex, uh, uh, it's only a property of systems with, uh, uh, with short-range interactions, while systems with long-range interactions, in particular this system, can have a negative uh, slope uh, in the stress-strain curve, <coughs> and it can be stable. So to make some parallel to elasticity, uh, I don't know, uh, some of you might have noticed that, in fact, the, what are the requirements on elastic energy in, in nonlinear elasticity? So it's not that the energy should be convex. Uh, for instance, you know that some, in some constraints, the system becomes unstable when uh, strong ellipticity of the equations is uh, compromised. So strong ellipticity of the equation is lost much after the convexity of the energy is lost. And in fact, the real criteria on the elasticity, uh, on the elastic energy is that it's so-called quasi-convex. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not convex uh, at all. And uh, it recently have been an interest in these aspects of the behavior where it's uh, this is, the energy is non-convex. And, uh, and where is the long-range interactions in this system? So you can, uh, for instance, think that uh, non-convexity is in terms of certain components of strain, but other components of strains are still constrained by uh, compatibility conditions. So if you want to express the energy only in terms of uh, uh, strain, uh, you can uh, eliminate the, uh, in, uh, the, you can leave only the, the, uh, the convexity defining uh, elements of strain and you can eliminate others by uh, solving incompatibility conditions. And then you will have a nonlinear, uh, uh, sorry, non-local in terms of these components of strain with respect to which uh, you have non-convexity, you will have a non-local energy. So you integrate out, in a sense, other uh, convex variables and you end up with a non-local energy. So elasticity is highly non-local system and that's why in elasticity the energy can be also non-convex. So this is a, just a cartoonish example of, of what, in fact, the non-linear elasticity is a, uh, is a typical behavior. Of course, I'm talking about uh, non, uh, outside of the t usual linear range where those effects are usually neglected. Okay, so there are different parallels. Now, what's happening in this negative, when there is this negative slope? So how the system behaves? So the analysis, uh, more detailed that I would not report here, shows that you have a collective switching uh, of this between these two power stroke position. In fact, the system develops macro energy wells and uh, kind of switches from one state to another. So this is the analog of uh, kind of the main structures in, uh, for instance, ferromagnets, but since this system uh, is zero dimensional in the sense it doesn't have spatial uh, dimension, so uh, those uh, oscillations, collective oscillations are happening in time rather than in space. Uh, now, uh, then if you change temperature, there is a, uh, this critical regime that separates the... So this is fully uncorrelated behavior that happens at very large temperatures, but as we've seen at low temperatures, there is this collective uh, or coherent uh, response of the system. Now, another feature of systems with long-range interactions is that the system in hard device and in soft device uh, do not behave in the same way. And we know this in mechanics that uh, uh, loading device plays a big role in, uh, uh, and, uh, in stability of the system and even in performance of the system. But it's also true in muscles. So for instance, the stress-strain relation is non-monotone in the hard device, but it's monotone in the soft device and it forms a plateau. And this is a plateau that people see uh, in experiments because they look at the chains of those units 
which is closer to the system in a soft device than in a hard device. So the constraint of each element is much softer than uh, in this system. So this is another so-called ensemble non-equivalence, which is uh, also a feature of, uh, mm, uh, of systems with long-range interactions. Interestingly, another system like this is a self-gravitating systems. Uh, they also show uh, ensemble non-equivalence because the gravitational forces are long-range interacting, uh, uh, long-range uh, type of forces. So there are all kinds of interesting parallels here between muscles and uh, other systems that we, we know. Now, if we really try to put numbers here in the space of parameters and to put... Uh, uh, to try to un understand where the system, uh, where the realistic muscle system is, it's very close to the critical line. So the proximity to critical point or critical line in this parameter space allows muscle to amplify interaction and achieve considerable robustness in front of random perturbations. So this is another big theme that I will not uh, talk about here. It's, there's a common understanding that many biological systems are posed uh, near, in the near critical condition that, uh, uh, that allow uh, uh, global response to certain perturbation and certain stability. Uh, and this is one of the big challenges because we are building our structures in a very uh, nice and non-critical uh, kind of uh, domain of parameters, while nature seemed to be uh, building in a, it's using very different engineering principles, if you want. And uh, this is, we see here, some features of it. All right, so this was equilibrium. We can also study uh, uh, full dynamics of it. And dynamics, it would be, of course, over them dynamics. Inertia here is not important. But we have to have a presence of temperature, and it's present in the form of random terms here. Those are white noises here. So those are systems of Langevin equations versus conventional kind of Newton equation, overdamped Newton equations. But otherwise, we know everything about the system, so we can run simulations. And this shows that for this uh, uh, fast response, we can reproduce quite faithfully certain features. For instance, before we did this work, there was a big mystery while in so-called isometric and isotonic conditions, muscles behave very differently. But in fact, it's a difference between hard and soft device, and this analysis shows that the barriers are quite different for the collective power stroke, and that's why kinetics, for instance, in the soft device is much slower orders of magnitude slower than in the, in the hard device. So it, was, so it was quite helpful to use mechanics in the domain, which was totally dominated by, uh, 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 by chemistry. Because if you look at any books on, on muscles, the, uh, the apparatus that is used is uh, chemical reactions. Uh, so they, uh, they model different transitions as uh, chemical reactions, but then they have to postulate information about the barriers, and uh, you cannot see in this way the real size of the barriers, which in fact dictated by mechanics. Okay, so here observations are that we deal with a system with domineering long-range interactions. Those systems exhibit non-additivity, if you want, uh, uh, and, for instance, mixing states is energetically expensive. That's why the, uh, you don't kind of homogenize uh, uh, as, uh, as you do in the system with short-range interactions. And it shows anomalous thermodynamics and anomalous kinetics. Now, I don't have uh, much time to talk about activity, but I'll show you some other uh, just maybe more uh, now we move into active behavior, which is another big field here. And uh, uh, one question is, for instance, if really those elements have this negative slope, and then you organize in the myofibril the serious connection of such elements, we know that it, it should uh, uh, exhibit some, uh, some uh, strain localization. 
so which doesn't happen. And this is linked to the presence of activity. So the question is how to maintain distributed mechanical system in a, set, in a state with negative stiffness while avoiding instability, and also how it, it can be uh, po uh, posited to a critical state. And here the, the first place where activity is present. So what is activity? <laughs> so in fact, the question is very fundamental. Uh, there is a fuel there, yes, uh, which can burn. But now we have a system with few mechanical degrees of freedom. Uh, how to represent the action of this fuel on these few mechanical degrees of freedom? We don't have a pistons here. We don't have combustion. We, the only thing we know is that there is an out of equilibrium reaction of this ATP hydrolysis. And we need to see how it affects uh, this type of, for instance, machine. And we know that white noise is provided by the environment, so we already know how to account for the presence of temperature. But how to account for this, uh, mm, uh, this chemical reaction? And the proposition that has been explored so far is that it's also a noise. It's, it's, it's not a deter deterministic force, of course. It's a noise with zero average. The only thing we can say is that it should be correlated. So it cannot be non-correlated because non-correlated noise would be a feature of equilibrium system, while those systems are out of equilibrium. So the only thing we can say is that it's correlated. But how it's correlated? There are many ways how you can produce a correlated noise. So let's look uh, at this simple example, how it, uh, different type of noises would affect the system. And uh, again, I'll be a bit sketchy here. We'll make the system. We expose this degree of freedom x to, uh, to two noises. One is the white noise, and another is this f of t. Essentially, you can view it as, it's a, as a linear term in this potential. So it's just shaking your potential, shaking with a zero average. But it's a correlated noise. And we would like to see what kind of energy landscape this variable is seeing. So. Uh, we can write the non-equilibrium free energy of the system in terms of uh, variable y. So you would say that if this noise, uh, noises would be absent, then y would also see double well potential, like variable x. But uh, here you have to average over disorder and over time of the behavior of this inner degree of freedom. And that's how you can. Uh, find the force that exerted on the spring by this element, and finally find the effective energy of the system. Now, the, if you start doing just simulations, for instance, one noise may be just a periodic noise, a periodic uh, square kind of a signal. It switches between 1 and min or a and minus a at a certain time period tau. Uh, you will see that the effective stress-strain curve develops some additional uh, range here. So, so if your initial potential was a double well, the effective potential may be triple well. So uh, that's a very kind of important observation. So we know general fact that if we put a white noise to a system, maybe with a double well, if this noise is sufficiently uh, intensive, uh, intense, then uh, the system will average over the, the different wells and the effective free energy will become convex. And here, it's, since the noise is correlated, you have an opposite effect. The system can develop energy wells. So you can artificially, by just uh, stimulating it in this way, create complex energy landscape which would only exist while the system is being stimulated in this non-equilibrium way. So this is a simple example where uh, analytical computations can be done. Uh, so you have three, sta three uh, kind of parts in your, uh, in your, this is just particular approximations was made when the uh, period of the noise is much larger than the time scale of crossing the barrier. So in this approximation, everything can be done analytically. And you have these three stages. Uh, you, have, you can have double well potential. If your white noise is very strong, you have a convex potential. But if also the uh, correlated noise is strong, you will have a triple potential. 
So if you think, uh, what does it remind us? Uh, in fact, it reminds us the, uh, the so-called upright pendulum, yes? So uh, sometimes it's called Kapitsa pendulum. Uh, you know that uh, this position of the pendulum is stable, while this position is unstable. But if you start oscillating the support, position of the support, you can stabilize it. For instance, rockets that we launch, uh, if you will decide to make a rocket in your garage, uh, the simple rocket would just fly like, say, 10 kilometers at most. You can focus it. But if you want to fly like 400 kilometers, you have to stabilize it at the stage of, uh, of the launch. And that's done by four engines here that uh, kind of work in a solitary way. And they stabilize this vertical position uh, uh, at, 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 at the uh, stage of ascent. So it's, it's an example of this type of, it's not a, uh, a noise in this case, it's a highly correlated signal, but that creates, it stabilizes the upright position. And so here something similar is happening, uh, but in stochastic system rather than deterministic. In the pendulum, it's related to inertial properties of the system, and here it's related to overdamped properties. So, so that shows that the presence of this noise can, uh, uh, can create, st can stabilize this unstable position and uh, kind of uh, make a more monotone, monotone response here. This is an example of a different noise, so-called dichotomous noise, where instead of periodic oscillations, we have kind of Poisson distributed uh, uh, switches between the two states. The behavior is the same. However, if we take another noise, so-called ornstein ullenbeck noise, it's another type of uh, correlated noise uh, with the same first and second moments as the dichotomous noise. We don't have this stage. So we don't have this so-called third phase where you have third energy well. So it's still a big mystery in this uh, kind of whole business how to represent this non-equilibrium chemical reactions because different non-equilibrium noises can uh, generate different physical effects. And, uh, but at least it's clear that presence of activity can stabilize unstable states and maybe position the system, uh, uh, control the stiffness. So there is no given stiffness here. It's the system is living. It's active. So by intensifying those hydrolysis or suppressing it, the system may change its properties. So that's another interesting feature that we would like to emulate. So I guess I'm out of, uh, so I don't have time to describe really this active force generation. Uh, but in fact, uh, if you try to implement the same idea of this uh, uh, noise, uh, but now uh, take the attachment detachment into consideration. Uh, you can describe uh, uh, you can describe, for instance, this phenomena that uh, when you suddenly change the force, you remember that we started with a mechanical experiment when we abruptly we change in the length. Now if we change the force, then the system relaxes. And then it starts to contract under the given force. And there is a force-velocity relation. Uh, it's like this. And you see it's very unusual. You, uh, like, for instance, force-velocity relation, it means that the system uh, here, force and velocity may have different signs. So you, you apply load from this direction, and you would expect, for instance, the system to, be, to go to the right if, the, if it's just a friction. But this system goes to the left. It's active. So you have a range where force multiplied by velocity is negative rather than positive. It's kind of anti-dissipative or active behavior. And, uh, and the challenge is to explain this. And uh, here the models of this type can be <coughs> adjusted so that uh, you, you can obtain this behavior. I don't have time maybe to talk about this in detail. But uh, we were able to reproduce this biochemical cycle fully in terms of mechanical model, which has just this simple element. It has these uh, uh, springs by stable elements. It has uh, white noise, and it has a correlated noise. So that's what behind the chemistry, in fact. Uh, 
so now I finish. So the challenge is really to make a continuum model now. And uh, we are not there yet. Uh, of course, there are many elements even uh, inside the uh, fiber. There are, uh, there are this uh, 5,000 of cross bridges there. But uh, the, the problem is that uh, there are several unusual features. Hierarchical architecture with the domineering long range interaction. Uh, the system is, uh, has a scale invariance. It's near critical state. You have long range interactions. You have metastability that I didn't talk enough about it, glassy behavior. Uh, and there is active force generation. And ultimately, it's very far from, from equilibrium. So with this, I finish. Just the mastery of muscle machinery is a crucial step in the biomimetic designs of model and metastructures endowed with active mechanical properties. That's a quotation from one of the recent papers, people who try to make artificial devices like this. But hopefully we can make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now is time for questions. Kind of at the beginning, you showed this uh, non-monotonous behavior. What is this, uh, uh, the size uh, of this kind of, what is the amplitude uh, in terms of temperature? Uh, you see what I mean then when it goes up and down, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, well, at large uh, temperatures, of course, it disappears. So, no, 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 no. but I mean, for. This, uh, what is the size of, of this, uh, yeah, from uh, yeah, here? Uh, because it, it is energy, right? I must. Uh, you see nano newtons. So, yeah, like, but if I am trying to 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 calculate it in terms of temperature, right? You can. Yes. Uh, no. So, it's it's uh, clearly the uh, it, those are for cold, relatively cold systems. Yes. So when no, it's no, no. temperature so, is separate. Uh, the the size of the energy, uh, how many degrees? <coughs> I mean, in terms of kT. No, mm -hmm. You can calculate Newton's, uh, you know, to see whether temperature is much larger than this. Uh, non, um, no, I told you it's uh, temperature is, uh, here temperature is lower. So I, I don't know exactly how many kT is here, but, yeah. uh, but these barriers is, uh, this uh, height is, uh, now this is not an energy. This is already stress strain relation. So it's, it's a derivative of the energy. I see. Uh, so the energy has, in fact, uh, is non-convex. But mm -hmm. this barrier there yeah. in the energy is, uh, is uh, uh, larger than kT. Uh, no, 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 but look, I, I'm asking uh, the number. Uh, well, larger kT. kT, I, I can change. I can change the temperature. No, so but, a, but this, is for, this is done for particular temperature for where ambient temperature, where muscles work. I told you that if you increase the temperature, you lose this effect. So for the ambient temperature where muscles no, no. work... Uh, no, no, okay. The, le, uh, let's put it in the other way. You, you have this double, double well potential and you have a, a, a barrier there. Remember in your model? Yes, yes. Okay, what is the height of barrier? Uh, it is energy, right? Yes. Okay, uh, what is this energy in terms of, uh, you know, KT? As a, because this I can apply to for zero temperature, right? It doesn't matter. The, it's not about uh, temperature itself. Yes, it's yes. about uh, energetic of, you know, this model, right? Yeah, so, so I'm saying that the barrier is larger than kT if T is the ambient temperature. I don't remember the numbers. I think... Uh, uh, I, I, no, I, it doesn't sound as an answer. I'm asking... Uh, because it gives you a size of possible temperature, right? If you know in your model, so so. Yeah. Uh, what, what is this? Uh, what is this energy barrier? This temperature is higher than the ambient temperature where muscles work. I, okay, I, I have... don't. I cannot tell you exactly the value. Uh, it would be time but, for but, discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but of, I agree with you that when temperature is high enough, uh, this effect disappears. But what's interesting that in the muscles where temperature is there and playing a role. This barrier is not high enough. Uh, uh, this barrier is sufficiently high uh, to, to ensure that it's, uh, uh, that it's still non-convex. Uh, so the free energy is non-convex. It's not the original. The, 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 you see, there is yeah, yeah, yeah. questions which barrier you are talking about. This, 
original barrier or the barrier of the free energy because uh, original the energy is not barrier of free energy. Yeah. Yeah, but this is the this picture illustrates the barrier in the free energy, uh, which is due to long-range interactions. Uh, okay, I, I want to. But I, I cannot tell you exactly the number. I can just tell you that uh, uh, this uh, in in a, in a free energy, if you want, even the barrier is uh, larger than KT for the for the environmental condition where muscles work. Uh, okay, there are there is more questions, and we have very little time, so. So Lev, as we. As you train, what, what changes the most? Is it the fuel consumption? Is it the fuel, supply, uh, fuel efficiency? Or, or, or is it this double well configuration? Uh, I think you just develop a mass of, you, you just grow additional cells. Uh, uh, but I'm not a specialist in, on, on this side. I, I, I would think that uh, you, you increase the number of cells uh, uh, because I don't see how the elementary <laughs> units can be changed because uh, here everything is, uh, is uh, uh, just uh, kind of tailor-made uh, uh, because this cross bridge, it's a property of myosin molecules that you, you cannot change. And the number of attached units de depends only uh, uh, on, on temperature. So I suppose that you have additional fibers. Uh, but uh, you are getting bigger, yes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I think we used all so the it's time. Uh, my competence. Lev is around for whole day, so many of you have meetings with him. But uh, at 4.30, you can come for reception and talk to him about it. Thank you. Thank you.